hello and welcome to Art Pop Talk. I'm Gianna. And I'm Bianca. Hey, Bianca. What is up? Ooh, well, I just opened up that box of cookies that you sent me all the way from PA. Oh, I'm so They look so, so good. I mean, traveling that whole journey, I'm very impressed. They held up. Oh, good. Okay. I'm also glad to know that because I sent out your box of cookies, but I also sent some other people some cookie-like gifts, and uh, <laughs> I'm going to give away everybody's Christmas <laughs> that they're getting. And um, so hopefully they all arrived well. Okay. I'm glad to know that. No. I think you get Star Baker for sure. Oh, well, it was not me. I was only a sous chef in, in this baking kitchen that you received. Okay, well then, I don't know, you get half a star. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, well then, okay, that's, I yeah. guess that's fine. You still get a star. Um, so, Bianca, I really just want to jump right into it because we got served so much content last week. Taylor Swift released her sister album to Folklore and Netflix dropped their musical movie, The Prom. So, I need your thoughts on The Prom and your thoughts on Evermore. Yes. Wow. Okay. Jumping right in. I have a lot of thoughts. I feel like it's been a very nice and snowy week actually for both of us, Gianna, because it snowed here in PA today and there's more expected this week. And then back in Oklahoma, you guys got a nice little blanket Mm -hmm. and I thought it was the perfect way to end our semester at work so I could just cozy up with my cocoa and my Christmas cookies and enjoy some of this content. And Gianna, congratulations on starting your new job. OMG. Thank you so much. I wasn't sure if you wanted to talk about it, but I just want to say congratulations. Oh no, for sure. I'm excited. I think I'll get to it a little bit later, but um, I love this journey for myself. I'm really happy for you. Thanks. Okay, so my thoughts. Yes. I'm going to do Evermore first, I think. Okay. Which I thought was perfectly nice and totally fine. Is that what you say on a first date? (laughs) (laughs) I have. It didn't go so great. I I have described first dates. They are perfectly nice, but but just not for me. (laughs) And I'm going to say that about T-Swift's album, Evermore. And I think personally, I enjoyed Folklore more. And I just want my dear Swifties to know, I love you. Please do not take offense when I say I think that this duet album was just a bit unnecessary for me. I totally get what she's doing. And I really do admire her songwriting and storytelling skills. I think that folklore just had a little bit more teeth for me, and I thought it was a really impressive way to write an album with that kind of fictional narration of these like characters. And I'm sure that her fans are really happy to get yet another album from her in such a short span of time, which is awesome, and I'm really happy for them. Okay, now go to the prom. Did that suffice? Did that suffice? (laughs) No, I was just, I'm sorry. I was just thinking the whole time, like, I felt like I could feel you hold back. And I'm like, that's a bit of an understatement, (laughs) governor. Sorry. No, I'm not holding, I'm not holding back. It's just, it's just not for me. And I just want to, like, it's not because I I don't think it's like a perfectly fine album. It's just not Mm -hmm. what I need personally yeah which is fine but so what I'm really oh well what I'm really excited to talk about is the prom yes yes because I just I know you're gonna have a lot of good thoughts and yes 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 this movie has everything (laughs) (laughs) what is wrong I need to take a screenshot of you doing that Mm. this movie has everything from the gays to Meryl Streep now to the prom I hadn't really heard too much about the original Broadway show, which premiered in New York in 2018 after having been in Atlanta, and I think I was really happy to have a new movie musical to watch. I love a movie musical. I'm not ashamed about it, and I think Hollywood needs to bring them back in droves. I think Ryan Murphy has that very 
glamorous and saturated aesthetic that I do enjoy, which was definitely present in the film adaptation of The Prom. And I thought the cast was super cute. I love seeing my girl Satine, Nicole Kidman, back in some musical action. And I thought, of course, the plot, you know, it's really sweet. It's cute. It's happy. There's nothing wrong with the plot. I didn't love all of the songs. I think my favorite one is Love Thy Neighbor with Andrew Rannells. Yeah. And I, I really loved the beginning, the Changing Lives reprise where they're all singing about helping the lesbians. Yes, <laughs> like, to yes. the lesbians. Yes. It's like, <laughs> I, I loved that. And I think, you know, overall, like I said, the concept is, is very sweet, but I more actually appreciated the satirical approach to the celebrities' actions. You know, Broadway, celebrity, and like art, culture, get this liberal designation. But like we've talked about on the show, that can also be a very fake facade, this like fake allyship and fake, not fake liberalism, but like very put on mm -hmm. liberalism. So I thought that the action-based content and this idea of celebrity activism was probably the most like interesting undertone of the movie for me. And not, not that like the whole point of the prom wasn't fun, but yeah, for sure. I think you you really said it all there. And I think you know a Ryan Murphy film or show when you see one at this point. Kind of that mm -hmm. um, that retro vibe, that kind of nostalgic vibe, that saturation to everything. Um, I did really like the costumes in it with like all the glitzy, glittery sequence outfits. I really enjoyed that. There was some good bops in there. So yeah, overall, I liked The Prom. And I did think... As you said, Bianca, that kind of overall plot line was really interesting. Okay, but there is always something I can't get over with coming of age or prom movies. I can watch the most unrealistic movie ever and not be bothered by the plot line at all. But if there is a prom, I cannot allow myself to get lost in the movie or the show because the ways in which proms are shown on TV or in movies is the most unrealistic representation ever, in my opinion. And I know that this is just because I'm a bitter woman and it's not because I had a traumatic prom experience by any means. It's just because the experience was so like anticlimactic and just not cute at all. Like my prom setup was just not it, sis, at all. Mm -hmm. So, to paint you a little picture... <laughs> <laughs> Let me paint you a little picture. <laughs> the theme of my senior prom was Midnight in Paris. Okay, pretty basic. <laughs> Classic. Classic. Like, why does it have to be a cheesy theme? But okay, whatever. So, I don't even think mine had a theme, so you have a leg up. Uh, do I? <laughs> I'll continue. <laughs> so... This is what always cracked me up because they went to the trouble of creating a theme and making invitations, but the actual event, there was only like one Paris related decor and they were these centerpieces in the middle of like a couple tables, right? And mm -hmm. these centerpieces were just the bottom half of the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> so just imagine that you're cutting the Eiffel Tower like a quarter of the way from the bottom. So just like the little stubby leg part. Mm -hmm. And that was the centerpiece with probably, I don't know, I think these little like lights around it. And I don't know, what I just love so much about this object, the only visual indicator that this theme was Midnight in Paris, is that someone had to choose, I'm assuming. So I want to get the top half of the Eiffel Tower or the bottom half? Mm, I think I'll go with the bottom half. Like, who made this decision? So, I don't know. There, I love it. There will just I be love a good bottom half. Oh my god. <laughs> There's just nothing in this world that's more unrealistic to me than uh, a prom, prom scene. I don't know. Yeah. No, I hear you. I totally hear you. I've I've never in my life known a real life prom that looked like the 
prom we see on TV and in film. And Gianna was going to tell you, I know last week we were talking about wedding scenes in movies and TV shows. Mm -hmm. And I thought your your prom scenes are my wedding scenes. Oh, yeah, <laughs> for sure. In, in movies and, and film. But the the plot is great the 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 actual inclusive prom that they have at the mm -hmm. end of the movie is really sweet and i will say if anything it makes sense that this prom is not over the top but like very glamorous mm -hmm. for, as far as proms goes because they had like the celebrity money to back it <laughs> Yes, you're right. And I'm so... At, at least it's not like uh, Vanessa, Hus <laughs> Vanessa Hutchins. Ba Vanessa Hutchins. <laughs> Vanessa Hutchins, like, princess just getting married in a freaking airport. Like, So on that note, do we have any art news today? To piggyback off of our social media news last week, when we covered that Snapchat was doing a cash prize competition for its users, I had also seen that Tender is now doing something similar and is also partnering with Megan Thee Stallion to help promote their online dating competition called the Put Yourself Out There Challenge, a contest that will see 100 lucky winners awarded $10,000 each. The challenge is simple. Just set up a Tinder profile that authentically reflects who you are. Tinder quotes, We want to see personality, creativity, originality, realness, and inspirational profiles that showcase your vibe. Stop projecting perfection, put yourself out there, and celebrate being comfortable letting your unfiltered self shine. <laughs> <laughs> I love that Tinder is saying authentically put out your inspirational vibe it's That's, a fancy word a uh -huh. fancy phrase to just say yeah. vibe. but i like well, you it. know yeah i mean it's it's fine it kind of reminded me of the airy campaign i forgot what the hashtag is but mm. airy has like the the natural photos like the no filter photos and no photoshop I don't know why that, that reminds me of <laughs> Tinder, but you know, I am not single anymore, but I wonder if my boyfriend and I can work on this so that I can get $10,000 for APT. I mean, I just want to say I've been on Tinder and, you know, just from what I personally experienced on there, I bet that one of us would have a pretty good shot. I know. So I think if you, me, PA, Audrey Kaminsky, and the boys of APT all tried, one of us would have to get it, right? <laughs> I would think so, but I also feel as though perhaps I should be the spokesperson for Tinder. Um, yes. As uh, someone who happens to have met their BF on Tinder. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I think Theban thought that I was catfishing him a little bit because he really, like, couldn't tell what I exactly looked like because I felt like I probably filtered the shit out of my photos. So, as a person That's who funny. didn't always perhaps show their authentic, unfiltered self on dating oh, profiles. Oh, I, def I definitely um, had a filter on my. <laughs> you know what? You do you, people. Like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I also wanted to talk about the Netflix show, The History of Swear Words hosted by Nicolas Cage, a proudly profane series about expletives coming out in January. So the six episode series will dive into the origins of pop culture usage, science, and cultural impact of swear words such as fuck, shit, bitch, dick, pussy, and damn. In each 20 minute series, Cage will conduct interviews with historians and entertainers and experts Guest stars on History of Swear Words will include comedians like Nick Offerman and Sarah Silverman, to name a few. So, Bianca, <laughs> I don't know about <laughs> you, but the little trailer we got of Nicolas Cage painting a pussy made me uh, a little bit uncomfy. Yeah, I'm really glad this is part of art news <laughs> because I shared the trailer on APT's social the other day and I was intrigued because I'm seeing like all these paintings on the ground I'm like oh what's this like what is Netflix giving us and then 
I'm hearing very uncomfy words, like descriptor words, and turns out it's Nicolas Cage, and he's like painting a flower that looks like a pussy, and, you know, explains the show. We're going to be talking about the word pussy. And, I mean, I think what I'll do is maybe watch an episode, and I think I, I would watch the pussy episode because I don't want to speak too soon, but you know, before they release the content of the episode, but I am hesitant about pussy being a swear word, and I guess... Gianna, now that you're reading the description, I am glad that they actually included the word dick as well. Mm -hmm. So that makes me feel a little bit better. But when I saw that, that the word pussy was being used as the exemplary word, you know, for the trailer of the show. I also think I got... the word that they're using to entice people to watch this series, I think is interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and I wonder if they're going to have a guest star. I would hope they would have a a woman or someone who identifies as a woman come on and, yeah, they... you know, talk about that word as well. I just feel very, I, I just right now, just having the trailer, I don't feel great about that, but maybe it'll be good. I don't, you know, I don't want to speak too soon, but we'll see. Yeah, I, I, I'm curious about it. I think what I also just thought was interesting I, I feel like you said a little bit better knowing the other words but i think also making a joke out of the word pussy at the same time so it kind of is frustrating that pussy is either what a derogatory word or it's either a joke you know what i mean so i'm kind of mm -hmm. like come on nicholas cage like what are we doing here like and yeah. maybe so let's talk about that and maybe the show will do that but I can't ignore mm -hmm. the ways in which they kind of advertise the series too. Right, exactly, exactly. So stay tuned because we should definitely talk about that come January and see what the what the substance actually is of the episode, but I'll I'll say at this point in time I am optimistically skeptical. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of an understatement, governor. <laughs> Okay, everyone, I think we're going to take a little break. And when we come back, we are challenging Spotify with our own APT rap. everybody last week we talked about our own spotify wrapped so this week we thought today's art pop talk would take a look at the first year of apt and marie kondo that shit we are going to look back at all the things that sparked some joy here in 2020 and then throw it the fuck out to ring in 2021 and hopefully never look back. We are also going to break down the top moments of pop and arts culture this year, then look at some of our favorite moments from the show. Also, thank you all so much for sharing your APT on your Spotify wrapped stories. You all are so sweet and amazing and we love you. And I love seeing art pop talk at the top of your listen. So that thank was kind you of so much. Like really wild to see. I don't know about you, Bianca. I know. Yeah. No, I really, I'm not gonna lie. I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to go through a quick recap. Here is APT's year in review. I feel like I'm presenting like a, like a business presentation. Maybe this is a good model for, you know, if we ever have to present, like, on Shark Tank or something. Ah, uh, yes. We'll just add it to the timeline. <laughs> <laughs> so, right now, you are listening to our 31st 
episode with our first episode coming out on April 28th, 2020. Wow. First episode, thank you so much for all of the amazing lessons you taught us about podcasting. We so appreciate what you did for us, but we are never going back to that first episode quality again. (laughs) (laughs) We have had seven guests on the show. Sid, Josh, Yannicka Starfields, Clara Titus, two team members at the OSU Museum of Art, and Juliana Poro. And just a sidebar, we also have some more amazing guests already planned for the new year. And we've been able to video record a few of those for our YouTube, which is something to expect a bit more in the coming year as well. We did a Q&A with Art Pop Tarts for episode 20, where we got to hear some of the voices and questions from listeners. We did an interview at the Oklahoma City Museum of Art, which you can watch some of it on our YouTube channel. I'm just really plugging our YouTube channel hard right now because we only have 26 subscribers. So if you want to just click that little button for shiggles on our page, that would be cool. And we're also linking any kind of pop culture and art news videos that we talk about in the pod on our playlist on our YouTube channel there. So just a little FYI for you if you haven't checked it out yet. Gianna, you know, we were also fortunately able to visit a few museums during this time which Mm. is something you and I have talked about doing on a larger scale obviously not with COVID but I'm glad that each of us were kind of still able to bring some of that museum conversation you know and talk about those visits on the pod. Lastly our watermelon sugar high episode is our most listened to episode of all time. It has far surpassed any other episode we have so wow thank you so much for listening to it and sharing that one we're so glad you're enjoying it and that that is apt wrapped well to add in a couple more numbers in there for you guys we also reached over a thousand followers on instagram which was a goal for bianca and i to reach before the new year so that was really great And we have also reached listeners from 10 different countries, which I think is really, truly the coolest thing um, that that we're getting getting to connect with people all over the world. So just wanted to throw that into the mix. Yay, I love it. So now I think, Gianna, let's talk about the top pop and top art moments of the year. But really quick. I want to know what was your personal top moment of 2020? Do you have a couple? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I feel like I can pick (laughs) some out. (laughs) Graduating with my BFA degree because no matter what some dumb Bumble Boy thinks, I worked really hard for that. And (laughs) my Gadstone concentration really paved the way for the work that I'm making now and the work I'm going to make in the future. P.A. Audrey Kaminsky's wedding. Oh, Talk about the most single bright spot that this year had to offer. <laughs> Look no further. She was beauty. She is grace. She's Miss United States. Um, <laughs> this bitch eats her pretzels on her wedding day. That was, that was the highlight. That was honestly. the highlight. I love it. You know, as well as the first mother-loving ever female VP, Miss Kamala Harris, Queen of Queens, Miss United States, if there ever was one. My goodness. (laughs) And as of recent, I've been doing a lot to get back into the art scene in Oklahoma. It was wonderful to curate a show with my Capstone Girls. And now I'm volunteering on an arts committee through the organization that Audrey PA works for, which is Oklahoma Visual Arts Coalition, OVAC, to help put together an annual exhibition called Momentum. This exhibition features Oklahoma artists under 30, and because of COVID, we are hoping to put together more resources, share knowledge about featured artists, and provide arts-based and social entertainment for art professionals and the community members alike um, virtually, all leading up to the exhibition that will come in the new year. So Mm. that has been really fun, and also so excited to finally get to be working in a gallery space once again. And hopefully once things go back to normal, getting to do what I do best here pretty soon, which is doing art education for adults. I love it. Yeah. 
so sorry that was like yeah I had a few but you know okay tell me yours <laughs> no that's really great yeah I think it's it's been a tough year and it has been a very tough year for a lot of people and I'm really grateful for these little bright spots that we that we have and we can look back on and so you know Gianna when you started talking about your job I realized that it is a year anniversary that I started my job oh my god it is yes Whoa. but it doesn't feel I'm very I'm very grateful I'm I'm incredibly lucky to have kept my job throughout the pandemic. I love my job. I am I work with an amazing team. I work with amazing students and I can't believe I've been there for a year now. That's it so just feels, you know, it, I know, I know my first real big girl job. Aw, congrats. <laughs> yeah. So that was great. I I also have to say the election. I mean, I mean, we've been in a in a very strange way we have been looking forward to 2020 for the past four years you know what i mean like it's <laughs> it's awful that this is this has been happening but election day just thank god goodbye pumpkin head i never want to see you again <laughs> yeah starting apt is definitely on my list yeah i I love doing the podcast. I love talking about art. It's something Gianna and I talked about for a while. And I'm, I'm again, weirdly grateful for the opportunity to have gone home during the spring and for Gianna and I to start the podcast when we were together in person. And I am also looking back at a cutie little bumble boy that I matched with over the spring as well. I Oh my god, you're so cute. I can't. Very, <laughs> very excited about that and grateful for 2020 bringing me on Bumble. All righty. Well, I think I'm ready to look at some of the top moments we had in pop culture this year. Oh, I'm so excited. Yes. So I thought we could start off with going through the awards of it all. So focusing on the film Parasite, Parasite took home the most awards at the Oscars 2020, winning- That's wild. I know. Uh, when that feels like forever <laughs> <laughs> Well, it kind of was. Winning four Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Directing, International Feature Film, and Writing for Original Screenplay. Not only that, but it also became the first non-English language film in Oscar history to win the award for Best Picture. Writer, director, and producer Bong Joon-ho won all three of the categories he was nominated for. Parasite was also the first film from South Korea to be nominated for international feature film or the category's previous name foreign language film and we wow. talked um a little bit about bong joon ho in our monster theory episode and, and yes yeah so moving along looking at the emmys schitt's creek had made history at the 72nd emmy awards as the first show to ever sweep all seven main comedy categories and so did the iconic Zendaya as she took the award for Best Actress in the show Euphoria, becoming the youngest person to ever win an Emmy for Lead Actress in a Drama Series at age 24, Zendaya. Queen. Queen. And new episodes of Euphoria, I think, are out. Oh, yeah. Which I'll, I'll be watching. Getting into the music of it all, as I said earlier, this was a big, big year for music. So, mm -hmm. looking at the Grammys, Billie Eilish won for Best New Artist, but perhaps the most talked about moment was Demi Lovato's debut performance of Anyone, a song she wrote days before her overdose. The emotional song marked the first time Lovato had performed on stage since the overdose in 2018. Demi- What? Yeah. Demi also went on to perform the national anthem before the Super Bowl in February, adding to a stacked halftime lineup that include 
included Jennifer Lopez and Shakira. So let us not forget Shakira's iconic moment that took meme culture by storm <laughs> and JLo looking so fantastic that the gays could not handle. We also covered the VMAs this year. Not an award show Bianca and I usually watch, but were in awe of the performances we actually got. So from Gaga and Ari debuting their Rain On Me performance and our first uh, glimpse into Chromatica on stage, Gaga took home five awards, including the first ever Tricon Award, Song and Artist of the Year. Two other artists who had a great breakout year was Doja Cat, who also slayed at the VMA. She did a really good performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also wanted to mention Dua Lipa, whose physical video won for Best Cinematography, but where we get our news, CBS Sunday Morning did a great segment on her, and um, I'm really excited for what she's going to do. You know, she just did that collab with Miley, so it's been mm -hmm. a good year for yeah. her. Segwaying into some more powerful music we got, this is in response to the Black Lives Matter movement, was from her, I Can't Breathe, and the Chicks come back with their song, March March. Just a lot of music this year. We got some amazing performances from, you know, the premiere of Hamilton and Black is King on Disney+, Plus. Yes. to queens of rap reclaiming their place in hip-hop music, Miss Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion. So we also had that moment that gave me the most anxiety, which was the SpaceX launch. <laughs> but we also had the fact that Elon Musk tried to name his kid after a formula with both numbers and variables. That was a th I mean, thing that happened, you guys. I can't wait for that name to show up in, like, the 2024 Book of Baby Names. Well, you know? <laughs> and forgive me for not, like, following up, but I believe, like, they weren't actually able to name him that because... No, they had to rename it. Right. So, like, <laughs> I don't know what the fuck this kid's name is now, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> 2020 was a big year for babies. Sophie Turner, Joe Jonas had their baby... Sophie Turner had a baby. Yeah, Nicki Minaj, Anderson Cooper, Gigi Hadid, Gigi Hadid, Gigi and Zane. Oh um, my gosh, Rupert Grant, and I believe Hillary Duff is pregnant again. Huh. But we also had Chrissy Teigen and John Legend share publicly their experience with the loss of their third child due to pregnancy complications. Along with support, they also caught a lot of flack for sharing a series of intimate black and white photographs documenting their family tragedy. In response, Chrissy said, quote, I cannot express how little I care that you hate the photos, how little I care that it's something you wouldn't have done, she wrote. I lived it. I chose to do it. And more than anything, these photos aren't for anyone but the people who have lived this or are curious enough to wonder what something like this is like. These photos are only for the people who need them. The thoughts of others do not matter to me. So just as parents, both of them felt compelled to share their experience, coming from a mm -hmm. place that we still don't speak about these happenings enough and don't recognize that these are kinds of traumas that mm -hmm. are some of the worst experienced parents and those who can carry a child could go through in their life sadly mm -hmm. and this reality that 10 to 20 percent of known pregnancies end in a miscarriage is still something mm -hmm. that you know we don't talk about all the time so chrissy teigen has made it a point to have difficult and meaningful conversations in her career mm -hmm. and in this moment so many people have shared um, the celebrities couple's pain as well and mm -hmm. so i think this was a moment really um worth sharing yeah, and I think it's a it's been an especially important conversation elsewhere, but also heightened during COVID because families, partners aren't allowed, aren't always allowed in the hospital safe mm -hmm. space. And in the United States, there are more complications. Women have more complications with pregnancy than in any other developed country. And this also, of course, impacts women of color differently than it does white women as well and mm -hmm. that's a really important conversation to be had especially during covid when women can be alone in these hospitals or in in any type of delivery space yeah for sure so 
Um, my heart goes out to that family, but I respect the hell out of them um, sharing that experience, and I think it was really important. Mm -hmm. I cannot not mention again the election results on Saturday, November 7th, <laughs> that the race was finally called for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. The California senator made history as the first woman, first black, and first Indian American individual to be elected vice president. Last, but certainly not least, this was a big year for Elliot Page. The second season of Umbrella Academy got great reviews and continued to rise in popularity. People are really excited for the third mm -hmm. season. And the actor announced he is transgender earlier this month. So this is so awesome. This is so fantastic. Mm -hmm. Paige has been an icon, an activist in the LGBTQ community, and we could not be happier for him. Yes, I'm just, I'm so excited. I'm so happy. So I felt like that was a great note to end on for yes. 2020 pop culture. Yes, yes. I love it. I love it, Gianna. Those are all, it's so wild looking back and thinking about <laughs> the month of February, <laughs> you know, yeah. hopefully trying to, you know, like we always try to do on the podcast, looking at what's happening around us and mm -hmm. bringing a little bit of, of light or conversation around something that is hurtful and negative and yeah and how we can make it better yeah so i am ready to talk about some of the best art moments of 2020 again looking back hopefully some of this art news allows us to think about how to heal and make our world better and and the arts have a role in that i mean so do celebrities we've, gianna just talked about celebrities being able to use their voice and speak up and talk about things because their voice often gets heard and hopefully we can start to do that with the arts as well and, and make some of this a little bit more accessible so number one in art news two italian sisters launched an <laughs> arts and pop culture podcast called art Bound. <laughs> oh she's funny <laughs> No, 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 no. I'm just kidding. I mean, it really did happen, but that's also a dream to be the number one art news, art podcast um, on the charts. Oh so God. maybe next year. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no the, real, the real number one, I think, is, is looking at all of the public art and discussion about public art and monuments that took place this year. Of course, after the police killing of George Floyd in Richmond, protesters transformed a statue of Robert E. Lee into an exclamation of Black Lives Matter. And in Charlottesville, which was the scene of the Unite the Right rally in 2017, a new memorial to enslaved laborers was installed at the University of Virginia, which is a campus famously designed by Thomas Jefferson, a slaveholder, and was built by enslaved Black people. Looking, you know, Gianna, we've had continual conversations about different monuments and the tearing down of those monuments and, and rectifying of of positive ones throughout the the duration of the podcast and i think i am excited to see people take interest in those visual markers and really think critically about what they symbolize and and wanting to learn and wanting to be anti-racist and and building public art that acknowledges everybody that acknowledges the land that we're on that takes inclusivity and equality into into account so i think that's been an amazing amazing art moment of 2020. number two change the museum we've talked a lot about the role of museums this past year how they're handling the pandemic how they respond and take action during civil rights and social reckonings and in tandem with BLM and the COVID-19 pandemic, museums are not excused from doing what is right. And there have been a lot of great Instagram accounts created to bring light to the inequality and discrimination that takes place in the art world, that takes place at museums. 
So change the museum, a better Guggenheim, and decolonize the art world were created in 2020, and those are awesome accounts to go follow. Indigenous artists had a growing presence in major art scenes this year, having shows and works seen at major New York institutions. In addition, the Met, which stands on Lenape homelands, hired Patricia American Norby as its first full-time Native American curator. Coming in at number four this past July, after years of advocacy, there was a bill proposing the establishment of a National Museum of the American Latino in Washington, which was finally passed by the House of Representatives. Yay! Uh, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we start to see some movement on that with the new administration. I'm excited for this next one. Okay, this next one is wild. Number five, Goodbye Met Brewer. The Mets experiment in an off-site expansion closed with the March lockdown and never reopened. So the Met Brewer was a museum of modern and contemporary art at Madison and East 75th Street on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And I was thinking about visiting the Met Brewer when I went up to visit my friend in the city in like September. So we ended up going to the Met Cloisters, but I was like, isn't the Met Brewer, isn't there like another Met site? <laughs> You're like, no. Nope. <laughs> it closed in March, like permanently. So I wonder <laughs> how many people uh, noticed that the Met Brewer actually closed permanently. And I want to talk to someone who actually went because I'm very curious what that was like. I'm just so interested in this because I, I don't know that much about it. And I also feel like, um, I don't know, it wasn't talked about that much. Right. But it's a so big deal. Real, <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, so in reality, projects at the Met Brewer never really, like, took off. Attendance was really low. I think there was hesitation in terms of critical response. I was reading a New York Times article that said there was kind of a lingering sense that the Met itself was actually relieved to see that it just permanently closed in March with COVID. Oh, really? But I did read, yeah, that the Frick collection will actually take over the space next year. So we'll see what the Frick does with it. But mm. I, I like, is the Frick doing modern and contemporary art with it? I don't know. I don't know, man. Looking back at public art, Black Lives Matter Plaza was renamed by the mayor of Washington, D.C. on June 5th after the Department of Public Works painted the words Black Lives Matter in 35-foot yellow capital letters, along with the flag of DC. Now, I know there's some hesitation as to the mayor's intent with the renaming of the plaza. However, this is also another huge monument to both BLM and the resurgence of very outdoor public artworks at a time of indoor seclusion. Gianna, do you remember when we talked about number seven, deaccessioning? Yeah, that was one the of our <laughs> early topics. Yeah, early little art news. <laughs> the, the pandemic's budgetary crisis led to the Association of Art Museum Directors this year to relax guidelines on liquidating museum collections. And so, yeah, we talked about this when it came out, but it led to a lot of conversations about museums, essential staff members, layoffs, personnel care, when money for deaccessions are going to quote unquote museum upkeep. What is museum upkeep? Are you upkeeping art while you're laying off personnel? So a lot of, a lot of conversations about this. I wanna make sure we also talk about the performing arts. As soon as quarantine began, around the world, dancers started teaching classes on Instagram. We see dancers coming into a really huge presence on TikTok, and there are different kind of outdoor spaces that dancers and performing art professionals have been kind of allowed to, to take over in a way. And I also, early on in the pandemic during closures, I was taking this Facebook Broadway class, like workout class, and all of these furloughed and laid off Broadway dancers were teaching different workout classes and Broadway dance routines on Facebook, and there was a donation page set up for them. So 
I want to make sure that we are also keeping in mind all of the amazing performing artists that are facing some hardships right now. Yeah. I remember when Number- um, Misty Copeland did a an Instagram Live or a Facebook Live um, event doing all these um, lessons with other ballerinas. That was really fun. That's awesome. Number nine, we talked about this. Simone Lee will represent the United States at the 59th Venice Biennale in 2022. Gianna and I will be going to Venice. <laughs> I Mark your really calendar, AP- bitch. APT needs a lethal booth at Biennale 2022, making her the first black woman to secure this prestigious commission. I'm very, very excited for Simone Lee. So exciting. Amazing artist. Yes, I'm so excited. I hope she just takes over the entire festival. Oh, I have the entire no doubt. Festival. Number 10. Okay, so this year was the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. And because of this, you know, museums really needed this fun little gimmick to start collecting women's art. And a lot of museums had originally pledged to purchase more, if not entirely, art made by women this year. Of course, that did not happen because there was no money to even pay their essential workers this year. But I hope that as museums start to recover, and we're able to purchase, showcase, highlight women artists that they keep that promise in mind and they look back and not just forget about it because it's not the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. You know, we need to hold museums accountable. And this also includes, of course, it includes artists of color, artists from the LGBTQ community, any minority community that is underrepresented in the art world we've got to hold museum and art institutions accountable just as we do everywhere else but yeah just i don't want them to forget that just because it's not the 100th anniversary right you still need to collect art from yeah not white men yeah just because a a 101st anniversary doesn't have you know a nice ring to it um (laughs) (laughs) okay bianca that was some great art news thank you so much for that recap did good job So we are now going to offer our top five favorite moments, episodes, or artworks discussed on these past 30 episodes of Art Pop Talk. Thank you. Oh my gosh. So (laughs) I think my favorite, one of my favorite moments on the podcast was this whole spiderweb entanglement mess of a timeline we have set ourselves up with (laughs) aka it's all harrison ford's fault it really is but i i feel as though harrison is is very much on its way yeah let me tell you it's a whole new world over here uh just start talking into my phone at night. Harrison Ford, Harrison Ford, Harrison audiobook, Ford. audiobook, audiobook. I would like Harrison Ford on my TikTok. <laughs> oh my gosh. He's reading our audiobook. Number two, probably Theban always choosing Andrew Yang over me. Mm, yeah. I mean, it's rough. yeah. It's quite a life I live. So the other day I was working on stuff for the podcast and we were talking about how he's a couple episodes behind. So I take a break and I go to see what he's doing and he looks up at me and says, hey, I I just got finished listening to this podcast with my two favorite people. And he says it in this cute kind of flirty way where I think surely, surely he is talking about his girlfriend's podcast with his favorite girlfriend sister right like surely so i said like ooh, like you know which episode are you on (laughs) this guy has the nerve (laughs) to respond with oh oh no 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 i'm listening to a sam harris podcast andrew yang is on i can't (laughs) Wait, has Theban since caught up on listening to our pop talk, or is he still trying to find Andrew Yang content over APT? You know, I think maybe I need to, like, catfish him again and, like, <laughs> put out little trailers that, like, just say, Andrew Yang, Andrew Yang, and then just lie to him, lie to all our listeners to be in on this prank. 
Um, but he has caught up since. I I'm happy to hear it. I can't tell you how caught up he is. Like, is will mm. he be listening to this episode on Tuesday today? Probably no. But he is he is more caught up. So I do give him some credit, but whatever. He's no Andrew. <laughs> Um, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, number three, I would have to say my interview with our first ever featured art pop tart, Miss Clara Titus. I don't know. It was really fun getting to discuss her work. Um, I mm -hmm. think her work is important and just getting to see the artist kind of formulate the work and see her in the studio is really fun for me and to be able to talk about that and share that on the podcast i really enjoyed mm -hmm. that now coming in hot at number four i would have to say using my platform to diss the boy who mansplained dating apps to me and slut shamed women once upon a time in an art critique I love it. I also want to, I think you and Clara talked about this in the interview, think about doing an art critique episode where yeah. we hear different, I really, <laughs> and that's something actually we were talking about at work the other day, thinking about how art critiques are actually super cool and they're really cool conversations, but also really, they're so juicy, really funny, really funny and, and museum juicy conversations. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, I, I think we really, there's, I don't know, so much content that we could use for like live streaming a critique or putting out content for a critique because that would also be really good for a drinking game as well. Take a shot mm -hmm. every time you hear a juxtaposition. <laughs> also a good APT moment. And then, I don't know, number five, I would have to say having Diotica here. That was such a dream interview. I just feel so humbled and honored that not only he took the time to come on our podcast, but that he mm -hmm. is also a listener and, um, mm -hmm. you know, took the time to really understand what our mission here is on the podcast and really resonate with that as well. So, I mean, that was a really big moment for us. So that, that was good. Yeah. Yannicka was, was on my list for sure. I think it was... It was a really surreal moment talking with such an amazing and really successful artist that we admire so much, but I also learned so much just from having a conversation with him, and and I, I mean, really, he truly changed my view completely of, of landscapes and, and how we think about personal space, which I, I just think is is wildly fascinating mm -hmm. which i will i will talk about in a sec but yeah it was it was amazing again I, I can't thank him enough first of all for for coming on but if you haven't listened to it yet go go listen to that that episode over your your holiday your winter break and and look at yadiga it, it was amazing i would also have to say one of my favorite moments was having PA at that time Audrey Gleason on the show wild and thinking about what to call all of the listeners and I think we were not nervous but we you know we want to make sure we're calling you something that you like and <laughs> you know and so they, like, we had this whole conversation you know before we started the podcast like what are we going to call the listeners how are we going to refer to them and then in the interview with Audrey, thinking about <laughs> tartlets and strudels and urge perp shirts. <laughs> urge perp shirts. <laughs> urge perp shirts. Like a pop tartlet, an art par art perp tartlet. <laughs> <laughs> no, but see, that's the thing. Like <laughs> urge <laughs> perp I just got so excited about art pop tarts that it just just came out differently than than I had thought in my brain. <laughs> but I feel like overall it's really worked and 
If you don't like being called a pop tart by now, I, I I'm sorry. I don't know what else to call you now. <laughs> if if you if you have a suggestion, now is the time to make it. If you so. identify with another dessert, please let us know. <laughs> <laughs> We're happy to accommodate that. Truly. Another moment or an episode I really loved was Josh Thoughts. I am really excited to have more Josh Thoughts in 2021. Our pop talk. Our pop talk. Our pop talk. Our pop talk. It was such a fun conversation because Josh, again, really opened up my eyes to different parts of music. And and obviously, that's been a part of our lives as long as we've known Josh. But connecting the dots between the visual and the auditory was such a fun conversation. And I love that Josh also really not opened up with us but was having fun talking about lady gaga and how you know all three of us how we have such different admirations for different types of visuals and different types of music but we're able to kind of have this really productive conversation about about women in music about women in the arts and think about how that connects to things like kandinsky and you know famous composers and I just thought that was such a fun conversation. And he also schooled us on a little bit of Lady Gaga information when he told us that chromatica didn't have any chromaticism and we didn't know that (laughs) chromaticism was an actual musical term. I thought it was like an aesthetic thing. (laughs) I repress that like memory. (laughs) I I try to block it out. But no, that's great. That's so great that you and I being such huge monsters are able to learn from someone who isn't, you know? And I think mm-hmm. that's just, it, it just kind of no. furthered that, that what, you know, what we want to do here on the podcast. And I hope that those are also the types of conversations that you guys are, are having wherever you are and when you listen to this podcast too. Yeah, I agree because if I had one chance to ask Lady Gaga one question, I honestly think I would ask her can you talk about the lack of chromaticism in your album chromatica like let's talk oh, about it oh i wouldn't it. ask her i'd be too nervous no i'd have to <laughs> but i agree love josh thoughts i feel like it's such a good like brother-in-law bonding moment to love to see it yeah my number four i think is going to be the episodes we did on the celebrity home tours the architectural digest home tours And first of all, I think it was such a good visual representation of pop culture (laughs) and visual culture coming together and what that kind of realm of art and celebrity look like. And it looks like a really nice house with (laughs) core. And I think through that, Gianna and I learned a lot. We had a lot of great feedback on the episode from some of the art pop tarts and thinking about how you judge someone else's home and how you think about someone else's their own personal aesthetic and and why does it matter that someone can afford a Kahende Wiley and why does it matter that Kendall Jenner has a a James Terrell in her home and and thinking about all those conflicting thoughts but really hearing a lot of great perspectives on on really all the pieces that we talked about within those two episodes that we did on the architectural digest tours and in the i was listening back to the episode the title is does this belong in a museum if you haven't listened to it yet and gianna says we need to take a shot every time we say stunning when we're talking about the (laughs) barbara kruger pieces in in kendall's home and i wanted to add that gianna i think i personally need to take a shot anytime i say the phrase wildly fascinating or the word fascinating (laughs) because listening back to the episodes everything is fascinating to me your fascinating and is my interesting so interesting <laughs> interesting we're gonna over the break we'll come up with some new fun descriptor words yeah <laughs> we are uh, aware of how repetitive we use these words that's wildly fascinating. but it's interesting <laughs> it, it's fascinating <laughs> and also in that episode I said, so the Barbara Kruger works, you know, they have good vibes on them. 
and I said, I really love these works, but I'm not really a good vibe kind of gal. And we had also talked about Sad Girl Central Station. (laughs) But the pieces themselves are stunning, as Gianna said. Stunning. Yeah, I think we're more like a Sad Girl Central kind of vibe. (laughs) (laughs) I want to commission Barbara Kruger for a Sad Girl Central Station. If we can recap a little bit of 2020, some of it was arriving at Sad Girl Central Station, and that's okay. That's a vibe. That is the vibe. And and it's great. That is the vibe when I was watching Titanic in my room, and you were simultaneously watching watching (laughs) Titanic in your room. (laughs) That that feeling is Sad Girl Central Station. <laughs> Celine. <laughs> oh my gosh. My number five, I mean, I've got to do it. Number five is finally being able to watch the watermelon sugar video. Anything for the tartlets because I, I, I could not, would not want to watch watermelon sugar <laughs> without being prepped and ready to discuss on the pod so i'm being sliced so up like that a mother my... loving watermelon <laughs> can't <laughs> i also listening back you know we had a lot of good she's the man quotes as a third party observer with no particular interest in the matter i'm not sure that barbara can or, but <laughs> <laughs> barbara and kendall make a good match so that is about a recap of APT in 2020. Gianna, I'm really looking forward to all the drunk art history videos we're going to make in 2021. Take a shot every time you hear the word juxtaposition. Maybe we should, you know, work on like a holiday drinking game or something. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not drunk right now. Um, no, I'm so excited for for all the content. We we got a lot of work to do these next two weeks. We um gonna try to be playing catch up for ourselves too. What you can expect from APT in the new year is we are gonna have some awesome interviews coming up for all of you after the holidays. We are speaking with some fellow podcasters as well as some more art professionals about art space academia and pop culture. And as always, if there is any content you are longing for, this is a great time to let us know. And you can always DM us on our social media or you can email us at artpoptalk at gmail.com. Yes, we are going to be doing a lot of work behind the scenes on the pod over the break. I know some of you have been thinking about a type of discussion group. We're going to be looking into that. We're going to be looking at different types of content. Hopefully coming into the new year, we can put out a little more video content for you guys, which is going to be great. We are just so incredibly thankful to every single one of you who has listened, watched, and interacted with APT over these 31 weeks. Gianna and I just are really so excited to come back in January bigger and better, and it's really because of all of the art pop tarts. Please tell your friends and family to join you as an APT fan. Hopefully, we've given you a lot of content to talk about during your holiday sessions with the fam. And hopefully, you've learned a little bit about arts and pop culture and you can have some really fun discussions uh, this holiday season, this winter season. We love all of you so much. Have a happy, happy holiday. Happy Hanukkah. Merry Christmas. Happy Kwanzaa. And we're wishing all of you a very, very happy and welcome new year. Goodbye. So long. Farewell, 2020. And with that, we will talk to you all next year. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.